History of England, Chapter 12, Part 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Read by Marco at New Orleans, 2007. History of England from the Accession of James II by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 12, Part 6. The views of Louvois, incomparably the greatest statesman that France had produced since Richelieu, seem to have entirely agreed with those of Avaux. The best thing Louvois wrote that King James could do would be to forget that he had reigned in Great Britain, and to think only of putting Ireland into a good condition, and of establishing himself firmly there. Whether this were the true interest of the House of Stuart may be doubted, but it was undoubtedly the true interest of the House of Bourbon. About the Scotch and English exiles, and especially about Melfort, Avaux constantly expressed himself with an asperity hardly to be expected from a man of so much sense and experience. Melfort was in a singularly unfortunate position. He was a renegade. He was a mortal enemy of the liberties of his country. He was of a bad and tyrannical nature, and yet he was, in some sense, a patriot. The consequence was that he was more universally detested than any man of his time. For while his apostasy and his arbitrary maxims of government made him the abhorrence of England and Scotland, his anxiety for the dignity and integrity of the empire made him the abhorrence of the Irish and of the French. The first question to be decided was whether James should remain at Dublin or should put himself at the head of his army in Ulster. On this question the Irish and British factions joined battle. Reasons of no great weight were adduced on both sides, for neither party ventured to speak out. The point really in issue was whether the king should be in Irish or in British hands. If he remained at Dublin, it would be scarcely possible for him to withhold his assent from any bill presented to him by the Parliament which he had summoned to meet there. He would be forced to plunder, perhaps to attaint, innocent Protestant gentlemen and clergymen by hundreds, and he would thus do irreparable mischief to his cause on the other side of St. George's Channel. If he repaired to Ulster, he would be within a few hours' sail of Great Britain. As soon as Londonderry had fallen, and it was universally supposed that the fall of Londonderry could not be long delayed, he might cross the sea with part of his forces and land in Scotland, where his friends were supposed to be numerous. When he was once on British ground and in the midst of British adherents, it would no longer be in the power of the Irish to extort his consent to their schemes of spoliation and revenge. The discussions in the council were long and warm. Tyrconnell, who had just been created a duke, advised his master to stay in Dublin. Melfort exhorted his majesty to set out for Ulster. Avo exerted all his influence in support of Tyrconnell. But James, whose personal inclinations were naturally on the British side of the question, determined to follow the advice of Melfort. Avo was deeply mortified. In his official letters he expressed with great acrimony his contempt for the king's character and understanding. On Tyrconnell, who had said that he despaired of the fortunes of James, and that the real question was between the King of France and the Prince of Orange, the ambassador pronounced what was meant to be a warm eulogy, but may perhaps be more properly called an invective. If he were a born Frenchman, he could not be more zealous for the interests of France. The conduct of Melfort, on the other hand, was a subject of an invective which much resembles eulogy. He is neither a good Irishman nor a good Frenchman. All his affections are set on his own country. Since the king was determined to go northward, Avo did not choose to be left behind. The royal party set out, leaving Tyrconnell in charge at Dublin, and arrived at Charlemont on the 13th of April. The journey was a strange one. The country all along the road had been completely deserted by the industrious population and laid waste by bands of robbers. This, said one of the French officers, is like traveling through the deserts of Arabia. Whatever effects the colonists had been able to remove were at Londonderry or Anniskillen. The rest had been stolen or destroyed. Avo informed his court that he had not been able to get one truss of hay for his horses without sending five or six miles. No laborer dared bring anything for sale, lest some marauder should lay hands on it by the way. The ambassador was put one night into a miserable tap-room full of soldiers smoking, another night into a dismantled house without windows or shutters to keep out the rain. At Charlemont a bag of oatmeal was, with great difficulty, and as a matter of favor, procured for the French legation. There was no wheaten bread except at the table of the king, who had brought a little flour from Dublin, and to whom Avaux had lent a servant who knew how to bake. Those who were honored with an invitation to the royal table had their bread and wine measured out to them. Everybody else, however high in rank, ate horse corn, and drank water, or detestable beer made with oats instead of barley, and flavored with some nameless herb as a substitute for hops. 
Yet report said that the country between Charlemont and Straban was even more desolate than the country between Dublin and Charlemont. It was impossible to carry a large stock of provisions. The roads were so bad, and the horses so weak, that the baggage wagons had all been left far behind. The chief officers of the army were consequently in want of necessaries, and the ill-humor which was the natural effect of these privations was increased by the insensibility of James, who seemed not to be aware that everybody about him was not perfectly comfortable. On the 14th of April the king and his train proceeded to Oma. The rain fell, the wind blew, the horses could scarcely make their way through the mud and in the face of the storm, and the road was frequently intersected by torrents, which might almost be called rivers. The travelers had to pass several fords where the water was breast-high. Some of the party fainted from fatigue and hunger. All around lay a frightful wilderness. In a journey of forty miles Avo counted only three miserable cabins. Everything else was rock, bog, and moor. When at length the travelers reached Oma, they found it in ruins. The Protestants, who were the majority of the inhabitants, had abandoned it, leaving not a wisp of straw nor a cask of liquor. The windows had been broken, the chimneys had been beaten in, the very locks and bolts of the doors had been carried away. Avo had never ceased to press the king to return to Dublin, but these expostulations had hitherto produced no effect. The obstinacy of James, however, was an obstinacy which had nothing in common with manly resolution, and which, though proof to argument, was easily shaken by caprice. He received at Oma, early on the 16th of April, letters which alarmed him. He learned that a strong body of Protestants was in arms at Straben, and that English ships of war had been seen near the mouth of Loch Foyle. In one minute three messages were sent to summon Avo to the ruinous chamber in which the royal bed had been prepared. There James, half-dressed, and with the air of a man bewildered by some great shock, announced his resolution to hasten back instantly to Dublin. Avo listened, wondered, and approved. Melfort seemed prostrated by despair. The travellers retraced their steps, and late in the evening reached Charlemont. There the king received despatches very different from those which had terrified him a few hours before. The Protestants who had assembled near Straben had been attacked by Hamilton. Under a true-hearted leader they would doubtless have stood their ground, but Lundy, who commanded them, had told them that all was lost, had ordered them to shift for themselves, and had set them the example of flight. They had accordingly retired in confusion to Londonderry. The king's correspondence pronounced it to be impossible that Londonderry should hold out. His majesty had only to appear before the gates, and they would instantly fly open. James now changed his mind again, blamed himself for having been persuaded to turn his face southward, and, though it was late in the evening, called for his horses. The horses were in a miserable plight, but weary and half-starved as they were, they were saddled. Melfort, completely victorious, carried off his master to the camp. Avo, after remonstrating to no purpose, declared that he was resolved to return to Dublin. It may be suspected that the extreme discomfort which he had undergone had something to do with this resolution, for complaints of that discomfort make up a large part of his letters, and in truth a life passed in the palaces of Italy, in the neat parlors and gardens of Holland, and in the luxurious pavilions which adorned the suburbs of Paris, was a bad preparation for the ruined hovels of Ulster. He gave, however, to his master a more weighty reason for refusing to proceed northward. The journey of James had been undertaken in opposition to the unanimous sense of the Irish, and had excited great alarm among them. They apprehended that he meant to quit them, and to make a descent on Scotland. They knew that, once landed in Great Britain, he would have neither the will nor the power to do those things which they most desired. Avo, by refusing to proceed further, gave them an assurance that whoever might betray them, France would be their constant friend. While Avo was on his way to Dublin, James hastened toward Londonderry. He found his army concentrated a few miles south of the city. The French generals who had sailed with him from Brest were in his train, and two of them, Rosen and Maumont, were placed over the head of Richard Hamilton. Rosen was a native of Livonia, who had in early youth become a soldier of fortune, who had fought his way to distinction, and who, though utterly destitute of the graces and accomplishments characteristic of the court of Versailles, was nevertheless high in favor there. His temper was savage, his manners were coarse, his language was a strange jargon compounded of various dialects of French and German. Even those who thought best of him, and who maintained that his rough exterior covered some good qualities, owned that his looks were against him, and that it would be unpleasant to meet such a figure in the dusk at the corner of a wood. The little that is known of Maumont is to his honor. In the camp it was generally expected that Londonderry would fall without a blow. Rosen confidently predicted that the mere sight of the Irish army would terrify the garrison into submission. But Richard Hamilton, who knew the temper of the colonists better, had misgivings.
The assailants were sure of one important ally within the walls. Lundy, the governor, professed the Protestant religion and had joined in proclaiming William and Mary, but he was in secret communication with the enemies of his church and of the sovereigns to whom he had sworn fealty. Some have suspected that he was a concealed Jacobite, and that he had affected to acquiesce in the revolution only in order that he might be better able to assist in bringing about a restoration. But it is probable that his conduct is rather to be attributed to faint-heartedness and poverty of spirit than to zeal for any public cause. He seems to have thought resistance hopeless, and in truth, to a military eye, the defences of Londonderry appeared contemptible. The fortifications consisted of a simple wall overgrown with grass and weeds. There was no ditch even before the gates. The drawbridges had long been neglected. The chains were rusty and could scarcely be used. The parapets and towers were built after a fashion which might well move disciples of Vauban to laughter. And these feeble defences were on almost every side commanded by heights. Indeed, those who laid out the city had never meant that it should be able to stand a regular siege, and had contented themselves with throwing up works sufficient to protect the inhabitants against a tumultuary attack of the Celtic peasantry. Avaux assured Louvois that a single French battalion would easily storm such defences. Even if the place should, notwithstanding all disadvantages, be able to repel a large army, directed by the science and experience of generals who had served under Condé and Turenne, hunger must soon bring the contest to an end. The stock of provisions was small, and the population had been swollen to seven or eight times the ordinary number by the multitude of colonists flying from the rage of the natives. Lundy, therefore, from the time when the Irish army entered Ulster, seemed to have given up all thought of serious resistance. He talked so despondingly that the citizens and his own soldiers murmured against him. He seemed, they said, to be bent on discouraging them. Meanwhile, the enemy drew daily nearer and nearer, and it was known that James himself was coming to take command of his forces. Just at this moment a glimpse of hope appeared. On the 14th of April, ships from England anchored in the bay. They had on board two regiments which had been sent, under the command of a colonel named Cunningham, to reinforce the garrison. Cunningham and several of his officers went on shore and conferred with Lundy. Lundy dissuaded them from landing their men. The place, he said, could not hold out. To throw more troops into it would therefore be worse than useless, for the more numerous the garrison, the more prisoners would fall into the hands of the enemy. The best thing that the two regiments could do would be to sail back to England. He meant, he said, to withdraw himself privately, and the inhabitants must then try to make good terms for themselves. He went through the form of holding a council of war, but from this council he excluded all those officers of the garrison whose sentiments he knew to be different from his own. Some who had ordinarily been summoned on such occasions, and who now came uninvited, were thrust out of the room. Whatever the governor said was echoed by his creatures. Cunningham and Cunningham's companions could scarcely venture to oppose their opinion to that of a person whose local knowledge was necessarily far superior to theirs, and whom they were, by their instructions, directed to obey. One brave soldier murmured, Understand this, he said, to give up Londonderry is to give up Ireland. But his objections were contemptuously overruled. The meeting broke up. Cunningham and his officers returned to the ships and made preparations for departing. Meanwhile, Lundy privately sent a messenger to the headquarters of the enemy, with assurances that the city should be peaceably surrendered on the first summons. But as soon as what had passed in the council of war was whispered about the streets, the spirit of the soldiers and citizens swelled up high and fierce against the dastardly and perfidious chief who had betrayed them. Many of his own officers declared that they no longer thought themselves bound to obey him. Voices were heard threatening, some that his brains should be blown out, some that he should be hanged on the walls. A deputation was sent to Cunningham, imploring him to assume the command. He excused himself on the plausible ground that his orders were to take direction in all things from the governor. Meanwhile it was rumored that the persons most in Lundy's confidence were stealing out of the town one by one. Long after dusk on the evening of the 17th, it was found that the gates were open and that the keys had disappeared. The officers who made the discovery took on themselves to change the passwords and to double the guards. The night, however, passed without any assault. After some anxious hours, the day broke. The Irish, with James at their head, were now within four miles of the city. A tumultuous council of the chief inhabitants was called. Some of them vehemently reproached the governor to his face with his treachery. He had sold them, they cried, to their deadliest enemy. He had refused admission to the force which good King William had sent to defend them. While the altercation was at the height, the sentinels who paced the ramparts announced that the vanguard of the hostile army was in sight. Lundy had given orders that there should be no firing, but his authority was at an end. 
Two gallant soldiers, Major Henry Baker and Captain Adam Murray, called the people to arms. They were assisted by the eloquence of an aged clergyman, George Walker, rector of the parish of Dunamore, who had, with many of his neighbors, taken refuge in Londonderry. The whole of the crowded city was moved by one impulse. Soldiers, gentlemen, yeomen, artisans rushed to the walls and manned the guns. James, who, confident of success, had approached within a hundred yards of the southern gate, was received with a shout of, No surrender! and with a fire from the nearest bastion. An officer of his staff fell dead by his side. The king and his attendants made all haste to get out of reach of the cannonballs. Lundy, who was now in imminent danger of being torn limb from limb by those whom he had betrayed, hid himself in an inner chamber. There he lay during the day, and at night, with the generous and politic connivance of Murray and Walker, made his escape in the disguise of a porter. The part of the wall from which he let himself down is still pointed out, and people still living talk of having tasted the fruit of a pear tree which assisted him in his descent. His name is to this day held in execration by the Protestants of the north of Ireland, and his effigy was long, and perhaps still is, annually hung and burned by them, with marks of abhorrence similar to those which in England are appropriated to Guy Fox. End of Part 6 History of England, Chapter 12, Part 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter 12, Part 7. And now Londonderry was left destitute of all military and of all civil government. No man in the town had a right to command any other. The defenses were weak. The provisions were scanty. An incensed tyranny and a great army were at the gates. But within was that which has often, in desperate extremities, retrieved the fallen fortunes of nations. Betrayed, deserted, disorganized, unprovided with resources, begirt with enemies, the noble city was still no easy conquest. Whatever an engineer might think of the strength of the ramparts, all that was most intelligent, most courageous, most high-spirited, among the Englishry of Leinster, and of northern Ulster, was crowded behind them. The number of men capable of bearing arms within the walls was seven thousand, and the whole world could not have furnished seven thousand men better qualified to meet a terrible emergency with clear judgment, dauntless valor, and a stubborn patience. They were all zealous Protestants, and the Protestantism of the majority was tinged with Puritanism. They had much in common with that sober, resolute, and God-fearing class out of which Cromwell had formed his unconquerable army, but the peculiar situation in which they had been placed had developed in them some qualities which, in the mother country, might possibly have remained latent. The English inhabitants of Ireland were an aristocratic caste, which had been enabled by superior civilization, by close union, by sleepless vigilance, by cool intrepidity, to keep in subjection a numerous and hostile population. Almost every one of them had been in some measure trained both to military and two political functions. Almost every one was familiar with the use of arms, and was accustomed to bear a part in the administration of justice. It was remarked by contemporary writers that the colonists had something of the Castilian haughtiness of manner, though none of the Castilian indolence, that they spoke English with remarkable purity and correctness, and that they were, both as militiamen and as jurymen, superior to their kindred in the mother country. In all ages, 
men situated as the Anglo-Saxons in Ireland were situated, have had peculiar vices and peculiar virtues, the vices and virtues of masters, as opposed to the vices and virtues of slaves. The member of a dominant race is, in his dealings with the subject race, seldom indeed fraudulent, for fraud is the resource of the weak, but imperious, insolent, and cruel. Towards his brethren, on the other hand, his conduct is generally just, kind, and even noble. His self-respect leads him to respect all who belong to his own order. His interest impels him to cultivate a good understanding with those whose prompt, strenuous, and courageous assistance may at any moment be necessary to preserve his property and life. It is a truth ever present to his mind that his own well-being depends on the ascendancy of the class to which he belongs. His very selfishness, therefore, is sublimed into public spirit, and this public spirit is stimulated to fierce enthusiasm by sympathy, by the desire of applause, and by the dread of infamy. For the only opinion which he values is the opinion of his fellows, and in their opinion devotion to the common cause is the most sacred of duties. The character thus formed has two aspects. Seen on one side, it must be regarded by every well-constituted mind with disapprobation. Seen on the other, it irresistibly exhorts applause. The Spartan, smiting and spurning the wretched helot, moves our disgust. But the same Spartan, calmly dressing his hair and uttering his concise jests on what he well knows to be his last day, in the pass of Thermopylae, is not to be contemplated without admiration. To a superficial observer, it may seem strange that so much evil and so much good should be found together. But in truth, the good and the evil, which at first sight appear almost incompatible, are closely connected and have a common origin. It was because the Spartan had been taught to revere himself as one of a race of sovereigns, and to look down on all that was not Spartan as of an inferior species, that he had no fellow feeling for the miserable serfs who crouched before him, and that the thought of submitting to a foreign master, or of turning his back before an enemy, never even in the last extremity, crossed his mind. Something of the same character, compounded of tyrant and hero, has been found in all nations which have domineered over more numerous nations. But it has nowhere in modern Europe shown itself so conspicuously as in Ireland. With what contempt, with what antipathy, the ruling minority in that country, long regarded the subject majority, may be best learned from the hateful laws which, within the memory of men still living, disgraced the Irish statute book. Those laws were at length annulled, but the spirit which had dictated them survived them. And even at this day, sometimes breaks out in excesses pernicious to the commonwealth, and dishonorable to the Protestant religion. Nevertheless, it is impossible to deny the English colonists have had, with too many of the faults, all the noblest virtues of a sovereign caste. The faults have, as was natural, been most offensively exhibited in times of prosperity and security. The virtues have been most resplendent in times of distress and peril. And never were those virtues 
more singly displayed than by the defenders of Londonderry when their governor had abandoned them, and when the camp of their mortal enemy was pitched before their walls. No sooner had the first burst of the rage excited by the perfidy of Lundy spent itself than those whom he had betrayed proceeded with a gravity and prudence worthy of the most renowned senates to provide for the order and defense of the city. Two governors were elected, Baker and Walker. Baker took the chief military command. Walker's especial business was to preserve internal tranquility and to dole out supplies from the magazines. The inhabitants, capable of bearing arms, were distributed into eight regiments. Colonels, captains, and subordinate officers were appointed. In a few hours every man knew his post and was ready to repair to it as soon as the beat of the drum was heard. That machinery, by which Oliver had, in the preceding generation, kept up among his soldiers so stern and so pertinacious an enthusiasm, was again employed with not less complete success. Preaching and praying occupied a large part of every day. Eighteen clergymen of the established church and seven or eight nonconformist ministers were within the walls. They all exerted themselves indefatigably to rouse and sustain the spirit of the people. Among themselves there was for the time entire harmony. All disputes about church, government, postures, ceremonies were forgotten. The bishop, having found that his lectures on passive obedience were derided even by the Episcopalians, had withdrawn himself, first to Rappo and then to England, and was preaching in a chapel in London. On the other hand, a Scotch fanatic named Hewson, who had exhorted the Presbyterians not to ally themselves with such as refused to subscribe to the covenant, had sunk under the well-merited disgust and scorn of the whole Protestant community. The aspect of the cathedral was remarkable. Cannon were planted on the summit of the broad tower, which has since given place to a tower of different proportions. Ammunition was stored in the vaults. In the choir, the liturgy of the Anglican church was read every morning. Every afternoon, the dissenters crowded to a simpler worship. James had waited twenty-four hours, expecting, as it should seem, the performance of Lundy's promises. And in twenty-four hours, the arrangements for the defense of Londonderry were complete. On the evening of the 19th of April, a trumpeteer came to the southern gate and asked whether the engagements into which the governor had entered would be fulfilled. The answer was that the men who guarded these walls had nothing to do with the governor's engagements, and were determined to resist to the last. On the following day, a messenger of higher rank was sent. Claude Hamilton, Lord Strabane, one of the few Roman Catholic peers of Ireland. Murray, who had been appointed to the command of one of the eight regiments into which the garrison was distributed, advanced from the gate to meet the flag of truce, and a short conference was held. Strabane had been authorized to make large promises. The citizens should have a free pardon for all that was passed if they would submit to their lawful sovereign. Murray himself should have a colonel's commission and a thousand pounds in money. Quote, the men of Londonderry, end quote, answered Murray, quote, have done nothing that requires a pardon, and own no sovereign but King William and Queen Mary. It will not be safe for your lordship to stay longer, 
or to return on the same errand. Let me have the honor of seeing you through the lines. End quote. James had been assured and had fully expected that the city would yield as soon as it was known that he was before the walls. Finding himself mistaken, he broke loose from the control of Melfort and determined to return instantly to Dublin. Rosen accompanied the king. The direction of the siege was entrusted to Maumont. Richard Hamilton was second, and Pusignan third in command. The operations now commenced in earnest. The besiegers began by battering the town. It was soon on fire in several places. Roofs and upper stories of houses fell in and crushed the inmates. During a short time, the garrison, many of whom had never before seen the effect of a cannonade, seemed to be discomposed by the crash of chimneys and by the heaps of ruin mingled with disfigured corpses. But familiarity with danger and horror produced in a few hours the natural effect. The spirit of the people rose so high that their chiefs thought it safe to act on the offensive. On the 21st of April, a sally was made under the command of Murray. The Irish stood their ground resolutely, and a furious and bloody contest took place. Maumont, at the head of the body of cavalry, flew to the place where the fight was raging. He was struck in the head by a musket ball and fell a corpse. The besiegers lost several other officers and about two hundred men before the colonists could be driven in. Murray escaped with difficulty. His horse was killed under him, and he was beset by enemies. But he was able to defend himself till some of his friends made a rush from the gate to his rescue, with old Walker at their head. In consequence of the death of Maumont, Hamilton was once more commander of the Irish army. His exploits in that post did not raise his reputation. He was a fine gentleman and a brave soldier, but he had no pretensions to the character of a great general, and had never, in his life, seen a siege. Pusignan had more science and energy, but Pusignan survived Maumont little more than a fortnight. At four in the morning of the 6th of May, the garrison made another sally took several flags, and killed many of the besiegers. Pusignan, fighting gallantly, was shot through the body. The wound was one which a skillful surgeon might have cured. But there was no such surgeon in the Irish camp, and the communication with Dublin was slow and irregular. The poor Frenchman died, complaining bitterly of the barbarous ignorance and negligence which had shortened his days. A medical man, who had been sent down express from the capital, arrived after the funeral. James, in consequence, as it should seem, of this disaster, established a daily post between Dublin Castle and Hamilton's headquarters. Even by this conveyance, letters did not travel very expeditiously for the couriers went on foot, and, from fear, probably of the Einskelliners, took a circuitous route from military post to military post. May passed away, June arrived, and still Londonderry held out. There had been many sallies and skirmishes, with various success. But, on the whole, the advantage had been with the garrison. Several officers of note had been carried prisoners into the city, and two French banners, torn after hard fighting from the besiegers, had been hung as trophies in the chancel of the cathedral. It seemed that the siege must be turned into a blockade, but before the hope of reducing the town by main force 
was relinquished, it was determined to make a great effort. The point selected for assault was an outwork called Windmill Hill, which was not far from the southern gate. Religious stimulants were employed to animate the courage of the forlorn hope. Many volunteers bound themselves by oath to make their way into the works or to perish in the attempt. Captain Butler, son of the Lord Montgarret, undertook to lead the sworn men to the attack. On the walls, the colonists were drawn up in three ranks. The office of those who were behind was to load the muskets of those who were in front. The Irish came on boldly with a fearful uproar, but after long and hard fighting were driven back. The women of Londonderry were seen amidst the thickest fire serving out water and ammunition to their husbands and brothers. In one place, where the wall was only seven feet high, Butler and some of his sworn men succeeded in reaching the top, but they were all killed or made prisoners. At length, after four hundred of the Irish had fallen, their chiefs ordered a retreat to be sounded. Nothing was left but to try the effect of hunger. It was known that the stock of food in the city was but slender. Indeed, it was thought strange that the supplies should have held out so long. Every precaution was now taken against the introduction of provisions. All the avenues leading to the city by land were closely guarded. On the south were encamped, along the left bank of the foil, the horsemen who had followed Lord Galmoy from the valley of the Barrow. Their chief was of all the Irish captains the most dreaded and most abhorred by the Protestants, for he had disciplined his men with rare skill and care, and many frightful stories were told of his barbarity and perfidy. Long lines of tents, occupied by the infantry of Butler and O'Neill, of Lord Slane and Lord Gormanstown, by Nugent's Westmeath men, by Eustance's Kildare men, and by Cavanaugh's Kerry men, extended northward till they again approached the waterside. The river was fringed with forts and batteries, which no vessel could pass without great peril. After some time, it was determined to make the security still more complete by throwing a barricade across the stream, about a mile and a half below the city. Several boats full of stones were sunk. A row of stakes was driven into the bottom of the river. Large pieces of fir wood, strongly bound together, formed a boom which was more than a quarter of a mile in length and which was firmly fastened to both shores by cables a foot thick. A huge stone to which the cable on the left bank was attached was removed many years later for the purpose of being polished and shaped into a column. But the intention was abandoned, and the rugged mass still lies not many yards from its original site amidst the shades which surround a pleasant country house named Boom Hall. Hard is the well from which the besiegers drank. A little further off is the burial ground where they laid their slain, and where, in our own time, the spade of the gardener has struck on many skulls and thigh bones at a short distance beneath the turf and flowers. While these things were passing in the north, James was holding his court in Dublin. On his return thither from Londonderry, he received intelligence that the French fleet, commanded by the Count of Chateau Renaud, had anchored in Bantry Bay, and had put on shore a large quantity of military stores and a supply of money. Herbert who had just been sent to those seas, 
with an English squadron for the purpose of intercepting the communications between Brittany and Ireland, learned where the enemy lay, and sailed into the bay with the intention of giving battle. But the wind was unfavorable to him. His force was greatly inferior to that which was opposed to him, and after some firing, which caused no serious loss to either side, he thought it prudent to stand out to sea, while the French retired into the recesses of the harbor. He steered for Skilly, where he expected to find reinforcements, and Chateau Renaud, content with the credit which he had acquired, and afraid of losing it, if he stayed, hastened back to Brest though earnestly entreated by James to come round to Dublin. Both sides claimed the victory. The commons at Westminster absurdly passed a vote of thanks to Herbert. James, not less absurdly, ordered bonfires to be lighted and a te deum to be sung. But these marks of joy by no means satisfied of Ox, whose national vanity was too strong even for his characteristic prudence and politeness. He complained that James was so unjust and ungrateful as to attribute the result of the late action to the reluctance with which the English seamen fought against their rightful king and their old commander, and that his majesty did not seem to be well pleased by being told that they were flying over the ocean, pursued by the triumphant French. Dover, too, was a bad Frenchman. He seemed to take no pleasure in the defeat of his countrymen, and had been heard to say that the affair in Bantry Bay did not deserve to be called a battle. On the day after the Te Deum had been sung at Dublin, for this indecisive skirmish, the Parliament convoked by James assembled. The number of temporal peers of Ireland when he arrived in that kingdom was about a hundred. Of these, only fourteen obeyed his summons. Of the fourteen, ten were Roman Catholics. By the reversing of old attainders, and by new creations, seventeen more lords all Roman Catholics were introduced into the upper house. The Protestant bishops of Meath, Ossory, Cork, Limerick, whether from a sincere conviction that they could not lawfully withhold their obedience even from a tyrant, or from a vain hope that the heart even of a tyrant might be softened by their patience, made their appearance in the midst of their mortal enemies. The House of Commons consisted almost exclusively of Irishmen and Papists. With the writs the returning officers had received from Tyrconnell letters naming the persons whom he wished to see elected. The largest constituent bodies in the kingdom were at this time very small for scarcely any but Roman Catholics dared to show their faces, and the Roman Catholic freeholders were then very few, not more, it is said, in some counties than ten or twelve. Even in the cities, so considerable as Cork, Limerick, and Galway, the number of persons who under the new charters were entitled to vote did not exceed twenty-four. About two hundred and fifty members took their seats, and of these only six were Protestants. The list of the names sufficiently indicates the religious and political temper of the assembly. Alone among the Irish parliaments of that age, this parliament was filled with Dermots and Gohagans, O'Neills and O'Donovans, Macmans, McNamaras, and McGillicuddy's. The lead was taken by a few men whose abilities had been improved by the study of the law, or by experience acquired in foreign countries, 
the Attorney General, Sir Richard Nagel, who represented the county of Cork, was allowed, even by the Protestants, to be an acute and learned jurist. Francis Plowden, the Commissioner of Revenue, who sate for Banow and acted as Chief Minister of Finance, was an Englishman, and, as he had been a principal agent of the Order of Jesuits in money matters, must be supposed to have been an excellent man of business. Colonel Henry Luttrell, member for the county of Carlo, had served long in France, and had brought back to his native Ireland a sharpened intellect and polished manners, a flattering tongue, some skill in war, and much more skill in intrigue. His elder brother, Colonel Simon Luttrell, who was member for the county of Dublin and military governor of the capital, had also resided in France, and though inferior to Henry in parts and activity, made a highly distinguished figure among the adherents of James. The other member for the county of Dublin was Colonel Patrick Sarsfield. This gallant officer was regarded by the natives as one of themselves. For his ancestors on the paternal side, though originally English, were among those early colonists who were proverbially said to have become more Irish than Irishmen. His mother was of noble Celtic blood, and he was firmly attached to the old religion. He had inherited an estate of about two thousand a year, and was therefore one of the wealthiest Roman Catholics in the kingdom. His knowledge of courts and camps was such as few of his countrymen possessed. He had long borne a commission in the English lifeguards, had lived much about Whitehall, and had fought bravely under Monmouth on the continent and against Monmouth at Sedgemoor. He had, a Vox wrote, more personal influence than any man in Ireland, and was indeed a gentleman of eminent merit, brave, upright, honorable, careful of his men in quarters, and certain to be always found at their head in the day of battle. His intrepidity, his frankness, his boundless good nature, his stature, which far exceeded that of ordinary men, and the strength which he exerted in personal conflict, gained for him the affectionate admiration of the populace. It is remarkable that the Englishry generally respected him as a valiant, skillful, and generous enemy, and that, even in the most ribald farces, which were performed by Mountbanks in Smithfield, he was always accepted from the disgraceful imputations which it was then the fashion to throw on the Irish nation. But men like these were rare in the House of Commons which had met at Dublin. It was no reproach to the Irish nation, a nation which has since furnished its full proportion of eloquent and accomplished senators, to say that, of all the parliaments which have met in the British islands, Barebone's Parliament not excepted, the assembly convoked by James was the most efficient in all the qualities which a legislature should possess. The stern domination of a hostile caste had blighted the faculties of the Irish gentlemen. If he was so fortunate as to have lands, he had generally passed his life on them, shooting, fishing, carousing, and making love among his vassals. If his estate had been confiscated, he had wandered about from bond to bond, and from cabin to cabin, levying small contributions, and living at the expense of other men. He had never sate in the House of Commons. He had never even taken an active part at an election. He had never been a magistrate. Scarcely ever had he been 
on a grand jury. He had, therefore, absolutely no experience of public affairs. The English squire of that age, though assuredly not a very profound or enlightened politician, was a statesman and philosopher when compared with the Roman Catholic squire of Munster or Connaught. The parliaments of Ireland had then no fixed place of assembling. Indeed, they met so seldom and broke up so speedily that it would hardly have been worth while to build and furnish a palace for their special use. It was not until the Hanoverian dynasty had been long on the throne that a senate house which sustains a comparison with the finest compositions of Inigo Jones arose in College Green. On the spot where the portico and dome of the four courts now overlook the Liffey stood in the seventeenth century an ancient building which had once been a convent of Dominican friars but had since the Reformation been appropriated to the use of the legal profession, and bore the name of the King's Inn. Their accommodation had been provided for the Parliament. On the 7th of May, James, dressed in royal robes and wearing a crown, took his seat on the throne in the House of Lords, and ordered the Commons to be summoned to the bar. He then expressed his gratitude to the natives of Ireland for having adhered to his cause when the people of his other kingdoms had deserted him. His resolution to abolish all religious disabilities in all his dominions he declared to be unalterable. He invited the House to take the act of settlement into consideration and to redress the injuries of which the old proprietors of the soil had reason to complain. He concluded by acknowledging in warm terms his obligations to the King of France. End of Part 7 Recorded by Robert Scott July the 28th, 2007. History of England, Chapter 12, Part 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 12, Part 8. When the royal speech had been pronounced, the Chancellor directed the Commons to repair to their chamber and to elect a speaker. They chose the Attorney General Nagel, and the choice was approved by the King. The Commons next passed resolutions expressing warm gratitude both to James and to Louis. Indeed, it was proposed to send a deputation with an address to Avaux, but the Speaker pointed out the gross impropriety of such a step, and, on this occasion, his interference was successful. It was seldom, however, that the House was disposed to listen to reason. The debates were all rant and tumult. Judge Daly, a Roman Catholic, but an honest and able man, could not refrain from lamenting the indecency and folly with which the members of his church carried on the work of legislation. Those gentlemen, he said, were not a Parliament. They were a mere rabble. They resembled nothing as much as the mob of fishermen and market-gardeners, who, at Naples, yelled and threw up their caps in honour of Massaniello. It was painful to hear member after member talking wild nonsense about his own losses, and clamouring for an estate when the lives of all and the independence of their common country were in peril. These words were spoken in private, but some tale-bearer repeated them to the commons. A violent storm broke forth. Daly was ordered to attend at the bar, 
and there was little doubt that he would be severely dealt with. But, just when he was at the door, one of the members rushed in, shouting, "'Good news! London Derry is taken!' The whole house rose. All the hats were flung into the air. Three loud huzzas were raised. Every heart was softened by the happy tidings. Nobody would hear of punishment at such a moment." The order for Daly's attendance was discharged amidst cries of, "'No submission! No submission! We pardon him!' In a few hours it was known that Londonderry held out as obstinately as ever. This transaction, in itself unimportant, deserves to be recorded as showing how destitute that House of Commons was of the qualities which ought to be found in the great council of a kingdom. And this assembly, without experience, without gravity and without temper, was now to legislate on questions which would have tasked to the utmost the capacity of the greatest statesman. One act James induced them to pass, which would have been most honourable to him and to them, if there were not abundant proofs that it was meant to be a dead letter. It was an act purporting to grant entire liberty of conscience to all Christian sects. On this occasion a proclamation was put forth announcing in boastful language to the English people that their rightful king had now signally refuted those slanderers who had accused him of affecting zeal for religious liberty merely in order to serve a turn. If he were at heart inclined to persecution, would he not have persecuted the Irish Protestants? He did not want power. He did not want provocation. Yet at Dublin, where members of his church were the majority, as at Westminster, where they were a minority, he had firmly adhered to the principles laid down in his much maligned declaration of indulgence. Unfortunately for him, the same wind which carried his fair professions to England carried thither also evidence that his professions were insincere. A single law, worthy of Turgot or of Franklin, seemed ludicrously out of place, in the midst of a crowd of laws which would have disgraced Gardiner or Alva. A necessary preliminary to the vast work of spoliation and slaughter on which the legislators of Dublin were bent was an act annulling the authority which the English Parliament, both as the Supreme Legislature and as the Supreme Court of Appeal, had hitherto exercised over Ireland. This act was rapidly passed, and then followed in quick succession confiscations and proscriptions on a gigantic scale. The personal estates of absentees above the age of seventeen years were transferred to the King. When lay property was thus invaded, it was not likely that the endowments which had been, in contravention of every sound principle, lavished on the church of the minority would be spared. To reduce those endowments, without prejudice to existing interests, would have been a reform worthy of a good prince and of a good parliament. But no such reform would satisfy the vindictive bigots who sat at the king's inns. By one sweeping act, the greater part of the tithe was transferred from Protestant to Roman Catholic clergy, and the existing incumbents were left, without one farthing of compensation, to die of hunger. A bill repealing the Act of Settlement, and transferring many thousands of square miles from Saxon to Celtic landlords, was brought in, and carried by acclamation. Of legislation such as this it is impossible to speak too severely, but for the legislators there are excuses which it is the duty of the historian to notice. They acted unmercifully, unjustly, unwisely. But it would be absurd to expect mercy, justice, or wisdom from a class of men first abased by many years of oppression, and then maddened by the joy of a sudden deliverance, and armed with irresistible power. The representatives of the Irish nation were, with few exceptions, rude and ignorant. They had lived in a state of constant irritation. With aristocratical sentiments they had been in a servile position, with the highest pride of blood they had been exposed to daily affronts, such as might well have roused the collar of the humblest plebeian. In sight of the fields and castles which they regarded as their own, they had been glad to be invited by a peasant to partake of his whey and his potatoes. <laughs>
those violent emotions of hatred and cupidity which the situation of the native gentleman could scarcely fail to call forth, appeared to him under the specious guise of patriotism and piety. For his enemies were the enemies of the nation, and the same tyranny which had robbed him of his patrimony had robbed his church of vast wealth bestowed on her by the devotion of an earlier age. How was power likely to be used by an uneducated and inexperienced man, agitated by strong desires and resentments which he mistook for sacred duties? And, when two or three hundred such men were brought together in one assembly, what was to be expected but that the passions which each had long nursed in silence would be at once matured into fearful vigour by the influence of sympathy? Between James and his Parliament there was little in common except hatred of the Protestant religion. He was an Englishman. Superstition had not utterly extinguished all national feeling in his mind, and he could not but be displeased by the malevolence with which his Celtic supporters regarded the race from which he sprang. The range of his intellectual vision was small. Yet it was impossible that, having reigned in England, and looking constantly forward to the day when he should reign in England once more, he should not take a wider view of politics than was taken by men who had no objects out of Ireland. The few Irish Protestants who still adhered to him, and the British nobles, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, who had followed him into exile, implored him to restrain the violence of the rapacious and vindictive Senate which he had convoked. They, with peculiar earnestness, implored him not to consent to the repeal of the Act of Settlement. On what security, they asked, could any man invest his money, or give a portion to his children, if he could not rely on positive laws, and on the uninterrupted possession of many years? The military adventurers among whom Cromwell portioned out the soil might perhaps be regarded as wrongdoers, but how large a part of their estates had passed by fair purchase into other hands! How much money had proprietors borrowed on mortgage, on statute merchant, on statute staple? How many capitalists had, trusting to legislative acts and to royal promises, come over from England, and brought land in Ulster and Leinster, without the least misgiving as to the title? What a sum had those capitalists expended, during a quarter of a century, in building, draining, enclosing, planting? The terms of the compromise which Charles the Second had sanctioned might not be in all respects just, but was one injustice to be redressed by committing another injustice more monstrous still? And what effect was likely to be produced in England by the cry of thousands of innocent English families, whom an English king had doomed to ruin? The complaints of such a body of sufferers might delay, might prevent the restoration to which all loyal subjects were eagerly looking forward and, even if His Majesty should, in spite of those complaints, be happily restored, he would to the end of his life feel the pernicious effects of the injustice which evil advisers were now urging him to commit. He would find that, in trying to quiet one set of malcontents, he had created another. As surely as he yielded to the clamour raised at Dublin for a repeal of the Act of Settlement, he would, from the day on which he returned to Westminster, be assailed by as loud and pertinacious a clamour for a repeal of that repeal. He could not but be aware that no English Parliament, however loyal, would permit such laws as were now passing through the Irish Parliament to stand. Had he made up his mind to take the part of Ireland against the universal sense of England? If so, to what could he look forward but another banishment, and another deposition? Or would he, when he had recovered the greater kingdom, revoke the boors by which, in his distress, he had purchased the help of the smaller? It might seem an insult to him even to suggest that he could harbour the thought of such unprincely, of such unmanly perfidy, yet what other course would be left to him? And was it not better for him to refuse unreasonable concessions now, than to retract those concessions hereafter, in a manner which must bring on him reproaches insupportable to a noble mind? His situation was doubtless embarrassing, yet in this case, as in other cases, it would be found that the path of justice was the path of wisdom.' 
Though James had, in his speech at the opening of the session, declared against the Act of Settlement, he felt that these arguments were unanswerable. He had several conferences with the leading members of the House of Commons, and earnestly recommended moderation. But his exhortations irritated the passions which he wished to allay. Many of the native gentry held high and violent language. It was impudent, they said, to talk about the rights of purchasers. How could right spring out of wrong? People who chose to buy property acquired by injustice must take the consequences of their folly and cupidity. It was clear that the lower house was altogether impracticable. James had four years before refused to make the smallest concession to the most obsequious Parliament that has ever sat in England, and it might have been expected that the obstinacy which he had never wanted when it was a vice would not have failed him now when it would have been a virtue. During a short time he seemed determined to act justly. He even talked of dissolving the Parliament. The chiefs of the old Celtic families, on the other hand, said publicly that if he didn't give them back their inheritance, they would not fight for his. His very soldiers railed on him in the streets of Dublin. At length he determined to go down himself to the House of Peers, not in his robes and crown, but in the garb in which he had been used to attend debates at Westminster, and personally to solicit the Lords to put some check on the violence of the Commons. But, just as he was getting into his coach for this purpose, he was stopped by Avaux. Avaux was as zealous as any Irishman for the bills which the Commons were urging forward. It was enough for him that those bills seemed likely to make the enmity between England and Ireland irreconcilable. His remonstrances induced James to abstain from openly opposing the repeal of the Act of Settlement. Still the unfortunate Prince continued to cherish some faint hope that the law for which the Commons were so zealous would be rejected, or at least modified, by the peers. Lord Granard, one of the few Protestant noblemen who sat in that Parliament, exerted himself strenuously on the side of public faith and sound policy. The King sent him a message of thanks. "'We Protestants,' said Granard to Powys, who brought the message, "'are few in number. We can do little. His Majesty should try his influence with the Roman Catholics.' "'His Majesty,' answered Powys, with an oath, "'dares not say what he thinks.' A few days later James met Granard riding towards the Parliament House. "'Where are you going, my lord?' said the King. "'To enter my protest, sir,' answered Granard, "'against the repeal of the Act of Settlement.' "'You are right,' said the King. "'But I am fallen into the hands of people who will ram that, and much more, down my throat.' James yielded to the will of the Commons, but the unfavourable impression which his short and feeble resistance had made upon them was not to be removed by his submission. They regarded him with profound distrust. They considered him as, at heart, an Englishman, and not a day passed without some indication of this feeling. They were in no haste to grant him a supply. One party among them planned an address, urging him to dismiss Melfort as an enemy of their nation. Another party drew up a bill for deposing all the Protestant bishops, even the four who were then actually sitting in Parliament. It was not without difficulty that Avaux and Tyrconnel, whose influence in the lower house far exceeded the King's, could restrain the zeal of the majority. It is remarkable that, while the King was losing the confidence and goodwill of the Irish Commons by faintly defending against them in one quarter the institution of property, he was himself in another quarter attacking that institution with a violence, if possible, more reckless than theirs. He soon found that no money came into his exchequer. The cause was sufficiently obvious. Trade was at an end. Floating capital had been withdrawn in great masses from the island. Of the fixed capital much had been destroyed, and the rest was lying idle. Thousands of those Protestants who were the most industrious and intelligent part of the population had emigrated to England. Thousands had taken refuge in the places which still held out for William and Mary. Of the Roman Catholic peasantry who were in the vigour of life, the majority had enlisted in the army, or had joined gangs of plunderers. The poverty of the Treasury was the necessary effect of the poverty of the country. Public prosperity could be restored only by the restoration of private prosperity, and private prosperity could be restored only by years of peace and security. 
James was absurd enough to imagine that there was a more speedy and efficacious remedy. He could, he conceived, at once extricate himself from his financial difficulties by the simple process of calling a farthing a shilling. The right of coining was undoubtedly a flower of the prerogative, and in his view the right of coining included the right of debasing the coin. Pots, pans, knockers of doors, pieces of ordnance which had long been past use, were carried to the mint. In a short time lumps of base metal, nominally worth near a million sterling, intrinsically worth about a sixtieth part of that sum, were in circulation. A royal edict declared these pieces to be legal tender, in all cases whatever. A mortgage for a thousand pounds was cleared off by a bag of counters made out of old kettles. The creditors, who complained to the Court of Chancery, were told by Fitton to take their money and be gone. But, of all classes, the tradesmen of Dublin, who were generally Protestants, were the greatest losers. At first, of course, they raised their demands, but the magistrates of the city took on themselves to meet this heretical machination by putting forth a tariff regulating prices. Any man who belonged to the caste now dominant might walk into a shop, lay on the counter a bit of brass worth threepence, and carry off goods to the value of half a guinea. Legal redress was out of the question. Indeed, the sufferers thought themselves happy if, by sacrifice of their stock in trade, they could redeem their limbs and their lives. There was not a baker's shop in the city, round which twenty or thirty soldiers were not constantly prowling. Some persons who refused the base money were arrested by troopers and carried before the provost marshal, who cursed them, swore at them, locked them up in dark cells, and, by threatening to hang them at their own doors, soon overcame their resistance. Of all the plagues of that time, none made a deeper or more lasting impression on the minds of the Protestants of Dublin than the plague of the brass money. To the recollection of the confusion and misery which had been produced by James's coin must be in part ascribed the strenuous opposition which, thirty-five years later, large classes, firmly attached to the House of Hanover, offered to the government of George I in the affair of Wood's patent. There can be no question that James, in thus altering by his own authority the terms of all the contracts in the kingdom, assumed a power which belonged only to the whole legislature. Yet the Commons did not remonstrate. There was no power, however unconstitutional, which they were not willing to concede to him, as long as he used it to crush and plunder the English population. On the other hand, they respected no prerogative, however ancient, however legitimate, however salutary, if they apprehended that he might use it to protect the race which they abhorred. They were not satisfied till they had extorted his reluctant consent to a portentous law, a law without parallel in the history of civilized countries, the great act of attainder. A list was framed containing between two and three thousand names. At the top was half the peerage of Ireland. Then came baronets, knights, clergymen, squires, merchants, yeomen, artisans, women, children. No investigation was made. Any member who wished to rid himself of a creditor, a rival, a private enemy, gave in the name to the clerk at the table, and it was generally inserted without discussion. The only debate of which any account has come down to us related to the Earl of Strafford, he had friends in the house who ventured to offer something in his favour, but a few words from Simon Luttrell settled the question. "'I have,' he said, "'heard the King say some hard things of that lord.' This was thought sufficient, and the name of Strafford stands fifth in the long table of the proscribed. Days were fixed before which those whose names were on the list were required to surrender themselves to such justice as was then administered to English Protestants in Dublin. If a proscribed person was in Ireland, he must surrender himself by the 10th of August. If he had left Ireland since the 5th of November, 1688, he must surrender himself by the 1st of September. If he had left Ireland before the 5th of November, 1688, he must surrender himself by the 1st of October. If he failed to appear by the appointed day, he was to be hanged, drawn, and quartered without a trial, and his property was to be confiscated. It might be physically impossible for him to deliver himself up within the time fixed by the Act. He might be bedridden. He might be in the West Indies. He might be in prison. 
Indeed, there notoriously were such cases. Among the attainted lords was Mountjoy. He had been induced by the villainy of Tyrconnel to trust himself at Saint-Germain. He had been thrown into the Bastille. He was still lying there, and the Irish Parliament was not ashamed to enact that, unless he could within a few weeks make his escape from his cell and present himself at Dublin, he too should be put to death. And it was not even pretended that there had been any inquiry into the guilt of those who were thus prescribed, as not a single one among them had been heard in his own defence, and as it was certain that it would be physically impossible for many of them to surrender themselves in time, it was clear that nothing but a large exercise of the royal prerogative of mercy could prevent the perpetration of iniquities so horrible that no precedent could be found for them, even in the lamentable history of the troubles of Ireland. The Commons therefore determined that the royal prerogative of mercy should be limited. Several regulations were devised for the purpose of making the passing of pardons difficult and costly, and finally it was enacted that every pardon granted by His Majesty, after the end of November 1689, to any of the many hundreds of persons who had been sentenced to death without a trial, should be absolutely void, and of none effect. Sir Richard Nagel came in state to the bar of the Lords, and presented the bill with a speech worthy of the occasion. "'Many of the persons here attainted,' said he, "'have been proved traitors by such evidence as satisfies us. As to the rest, we have followed common fame.' With such reckless barbarity was the list framed that fanatical royalists, who were at that very time hazarding their property, their liberty, their lives in the cause of James, were not secure from prescription. The most learned man of whom the Jacobite party could boast was Henry Dodwell, Camdenian professor in the University of Oxford. In the cause of hereditary monarchy he shrank from no sacrifice and from no danger. It was about him that William uttered those memorable words, "'He has set his heart on being a martyr, and I have set my mind on disappointing him.' But James was more cruel to friends than William to foes. Dodwell was a Protestant. He had some property in Connaught, these crimes were sufficient, and he was set down in the long roll of those who were doomed to the gallows and the quartering block. That James would give his assent to a bill which took from him the power of pardoning seemed to many persons impossible. He had, four years before, quarrelled with the most loyal of Parliaments, rather than cede a prerogative which didn't belong to him. It might, therefore, well be expected that he would now have struggled hard to retain a precious prerogative, which had been enjoyed by his predecessors ever since the origin of the monarchy, and which had never been questioned by the Whigs. The stern look and raised voice with which he had reprimanded the Tory gentleman, who in the language of profound reverence and fervent affection implored him not to dispense with the laws, would now have been in place. He might also have seen that the right course was the wise course. Had he, on this great occasion, had the spirit to declare that he would not shed the blood of the innocent, and that, even as respected the guilty, he would not divest himself of the power of tempering judgment with mercy, he would have regained more hearts in England than he would have lost in Ireland. But it was ever his fate to resist where he should have yielded, and to yield where he should have resisted. This most wicked of all laws received his sanction, and it is but a very small extenuation of his guilt that his sanction was somewhat reluctantly given. That nothing might be wanting to the completeness of this great crime, extreme care was taken to prevent the persons who were attainted from knowing that they were attainted till the day of grace fixed in the act was passed. The roll of names was not published but kept carefully locked up in Fitton's closet. Some Protestants, who still adhered to the cause of James, but who were anxious to know whether any of their friends or relations had been prescribed, tried hard to obtain a sight of the list. But solicitation, remonstrance, even bribery, proved vain. Not a single copy got abroad, till it was too late for any of the thousands who had been condemned without a trial to obtain a pardon. End of part 8
History of England, Chapter Twelve, Part Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Twelve, Part Nine. Towards the close of July, James prorogued the Houses. They had sat more than ten weeks, and in that space of time they had proved most fully that, great as have been the evils which Protestant ascendancy has produced in Ireland, the evils produced by Popish ascendancy would have been greater still. That the colonists, when they had won the victory, grossly abused it, that their legislation was, during many years, unjust and tyrannical, is most true, but it is not less true that they never quite came up to the atrocious example set by their vanquished enemy during his short tenure of power. Indeed, while James was loudly boasting that he had passed an act granting entire liberty of conscience to all sects, a persecution as cruel as that of Languedoc was raging through all provinces which owned his authority. It was said by those who wished to find an excuse for him that almost all the Protestants who still remained in Munster, Connaught, and Leinster were his enemies, and that it was not as schismatics but as rebels in heart, who wanted only opportunity to become rebels in act, that he gave them up to be oppressed and despoiled. And to this excuse some weight might have been allowed if he had strenuously exerted himself to protect those few colonists who, though firmly attached to the reformed religion, were still true to the doctrines of non-resistance, and of indefeasible hereditary right. But even these devoted royalists found that their heresy was in his view a crime for which no services or sacrifices would atone. Three or four noblemen, members of the Anglican Church, who had welcomed him to Ireland, and had sat in his Parliament, represented to him that, if the rule which forbade any Protestant to possess any weapon were strictly enforced, their country houses would be at the mercy of the Rapparees, and obtained from him permission to keep arms sufficient for a few servants. But Avo remonstrated. The indulgence, he said, was grossly abused. These Protestant lords were not to be trusted. They were turning their houses into fortresses. His Majesty would soon have reason to repent his goodness. These representations prevailed, and Roman Catholic troops were quartered in the suspected dwellings. Still harder was the lot of those Protestant clergymen who continued to cling with desperate fidelity to the cause of the Lord's anointed. Of all the Anglican divines, the one who had had the largest share of James's good graces seems to have been Cartwright. Whether Cartwright could long have continued to be a favourite without being an apostate may be doubted. He died a few weeks after his arrival in Ireland, and thenceforward his church had no one to plead her cause. Nevertheless, a few of her prelates and priests continued for a time to teach what they had taught in the days of the Exclusion Bill, but it was at the peril of life or limb that they exercised their functions. Every wearer of a cassock was a mark for the insults and outrages of soldiers and rapparees. In the country his house was robbed, and he was fortunate if it was not burned over his head. He was hunted through the streets of Dublin with cries of, "'There goes the devil of a heretic!' Sometimes he was knocked down, sometimes he was cudgelled. The rulers of the University of Dublin, trained in the Anglican doctrine of passive obedience, had greeted James on his first arrival at the castle, and had been assured by him that he would protect them in the enjoyment of their property and their privileges. They were now, without any trial, without any accusation, thrust out of their house. The communion plate of the chapel, the books in the library, the very chairs and beds of the collegians were seized. Part of the building was turned into a magazine, part into a barrack, part into a prison. Simon Luttrell, who was governor of the capital, was, with great difficulty and by powerful intercession, induced to let the ejected fellows and scholars depart in safety. He at length permitted them to remain at large, with this condition, that, on pain of death, no three of them should meet together. No Protestant divine suffered more hardships than Dr. William King, Dean of St. Patrick's. He had long been distinguished by the fervour with which he had inculcated the duty of passively obeying even the worst rulers. At a later period, 
when he had published a defence of the revolution and had accepted a mitre from the new government, he was reminded that he had invoked the divine vengeance on the usurpers, and had declared himself willing to die a hundred deaths rather than desert the cause of hereditary right. He had said that the true religion had often been strengthened by persecution, but could never be strengthened by rebellion that it would be a glorious day for the Church of England when a whole cartload of her ministers should go to the gallows for the doctrine of non-resistance, and that his highest ambition was to be one of such a company. It is not improbable that when he spoke thus he felt as he spoke. But his principles, though they might perhaps have held out against the severities and the promises of William, were not proof against the ingratitude of James human nature at last asserted its rights. After King had been repeatedly imprisoned by the government to which he was devotedly attached, after he had been insulted and threatened in his own choir by the soldiers, after he had been interdicted from burying in his own churchyard and from preaching in his own pulpit, after he had narrowly escaped with life from a musket shot fired at him in the street, he began to think the Whig theory of government less unreasonable and unchristian than it had once appeared to him and persuaded himself that the oppressed church might lawfully accept deliverance, if God should be pleased, by whatever means to send it to her. In no time it appeared that James would have done well to hearken to those counsellors who had told him that the acts by which he was trying to make himself popular in one of his three kingdoms would make him odious in the others. It was in some sense fortunate for England that, after he had ceased to reign here, he continued during more than a year to reign in Ireland. The revolution had been followed by a reaction of public feeling in his favour. That reaction, if it had been suffered to proceed uninterrupted, might perhaps not have ceased till he was again king, but it was violently interrupted by himself. He would not suffer his people to forget, he would not suffer them to hope while they were trying to find excuses for his past errors, and to persuade themselves that he would not repeat these errors, he forced upon them, in their own despite, the conviction that he was incorrigible, that the sharpest discipline of adversity had taught him nothing, and that, if they were weak enough to recall him, they would soon have to depose him again. It was in vain that the Jacobites put forth pamphlets about the cruelty with which he had been treated by those who were nearest to him in blood, about the imperious temper and uncourteous manners of William, about the favour shown to the Dutch, about the heavy taxes, about the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act, about the dangers which threatened the Church from the enmity of Purians and Latitudarians. James refuted these pamphlets far more effectively than all the ablest and most elegant Whig writers united could have done. Every week came the news that he had passed some new act for robbing or murdering Protestants. Every colonist who succeeded in stealing across the sea from Leinster to Holyhead or Bristol brought fearful reports of the tyranny under which his brethren groaned. What impression these reports made on the Protestants of our island may be easily inferred from the fact that they moved the indignation of Ron Quillo, a Spaniard and a bigoted member of the Church of Rome. He informed his court that, though the English laws against popery might seem severe, they were so much mitigated by the prudence and humanity of the government that they caused no annoyance to quiet people, and he took upon himself to assure the Holy See that what a Roman Catholic suffered in London was nothing compared with what a Protestant suffered in Ireland. The fugitive Englishry found in England warm sympathy and munificent relief. Many were received into the houses of friends and kinsmen. Many were indebted for the means of subsistence to the liberality of strangers. Among those who bore a part in this work of mercy, none contributed more largely or less ostentatiously than the Queen. The House of Commons placed at the King's disposal fifteen thousand pounds for the relief of those refugees whose wants were most pressing, and requested him to give commissions in the army to those who were qualified for military employment. An act was also passed enabling beneficed clergymen who had fled from Ireland to hold preferment in England. Yet the interest which the nation felt in these unfortunate guests was languid when compared with the interest excited by that portion of the Saxon colony which still maintained in Ulster a desperate conflict against overwhelming odds. On this subject 
scarcely one dissentient voice was to be heard in our island. Whigs, Tories, nay, even those Jacobites in whom Jacobitism had not extinguished every patriotic sentiment, gloried in the glory of Enniskillen and Londonderry. The House of Commons was all of one mind. "'This is no time to be counting cost,' said Honest Birch, who well remembered the way in which Oliver had made war on the Irish. "'Are those brave fellows in Londonderry to be deserted? If we lose them, will not all the world cry shame upon us? A boom across the river? Why have we not cut the boom in pieces? Are our brethren to perish almost in sight of England, within a few hours of voyage of our shores?' How, the most vehement man of one party declared that the hearts of the people were set on Ireland. Seymour, the leader of the other people, declared that, though he had not taken part in setting up the new government, he should cordially support it in all that might be necessary for the preservation of Ireland. The Commons appointed a committee to inquire into the cause of the delays and miscarriages which had been all but fatal to the English of Ulster. The officers to whose treachery or cowardice the public ascribed the calamities of Londonderry were put under arrest. Lundy was sent to the Tower, Cunningham to the Gatehouse. The agitation of the public mind was in some degree calmed by the announcement that, before the end of the summer, an army powerful enough to re-establish the English ascendancy in Ireland would be sent across St. George's Channel, and that Schomburg would be general. In the meantime, an expedition which was thought to be sufficient for the relief of Londonderry was dispatched from Liverpool under the command of Kirk. The dogged obstinacy with which this man had, in spite of royal solicitations, adhered to his religion, and the part which he had taken in the revolution had perhaps entitled him to an amnesty for past crimes. But it is difficult to understand why the government should have selected for a post of the highest importance an officer who was generally and justly hated, who had never shown eminent talents for war, and who, both in Africa and in England, had notoriously tolerated among his soldiers a licentiousness not only shocking to humanity, but also incompatible with discipline. On the 16th of May, Kirk's troops embarked. On the twenty-second they sailed, but contrary winds made the passage slow, and forced the armament to stop long at the Isle of Man. Meanwhile the Protestants of Ulster were defending themselves with stubborn courage against a great superiority of force. The Enniskilleners had never ceased to wage a vigorous partisan war against the native population. Early in May they marched to encounter a large body of troops from Connaught, who had made an inroad into Donegal. The Irish were speedily routed, and fled to Sligo with the loss of a hundred and twenty men killed and sixty taken. Two small pieces of artillery and several horses fell into the hands of the conquerors. Elated by this success, the Enniskilleners soon invaded the county of Cavan, drove before them fifteen hundred of James's troops, took and destroyed the castle of Ballancarrig, reputed the strongest in that part of the kingdom, and carried off the pikes and muskets of the garrison. The next incursion was into Meath. Three thousand oxen and two thousand sheep were swept away and brought safe to the little island in Loch Ern. These daring exploits spread terror even to the gates of Dublin. Colonel Hugh Sutherland was ordered to march against Enniskillen with a regiment of dragoons and two regiments of foot. He carried with him arms for the native peasantry, and many repaired to his standard. The Enniskilleners did not wait till he came into their neighbourhood, but advanced to encounter him. He declined an action, and retreated, leaving his stores at Bell Turbot under the care of a detachment of three hundred soldiers. The Protestants attacked Bell Turbot with vigour, made their way into a lofty house which overlooked the town, and thence opened such a fire that in two hours the garrison surrendered. Several hundred muskets, a great quantity of powder, many horses, many sacks of biscuits, many barrels of meal were taken— and were sent to Enniskillen. The boats which brought these precious spoils were joyfully welcomed. The fear of hunger was removed. While the aboriginal population had, in many counties, altogether neglected the cultivation of the earth, in the expectation it should seem that marauding would prove an inexhaustible resource, the colonists, true to the provident and industrious character of their race, had, in the midst of war, not omitted carefully to till the soil in the neighbourhood of their strongholds. The harvest was now not far remote, 
and till the harvest the food taken from the enemy would be amply sufficient. Yet in the midst of success and plenty the Enniskilleners were tortured by a cruel anxiety for Londonderry. They were bound to the defenders of that city not only by religious and national sympathy, but by common interest, for there could be no doubt that, if Londonderry fell, the whole Irish army would instantly march in irresistible force upon Loch Ann. Yet what could be done? Some brave men were for making a desperate attempt to relieve the besieged city, but the odds were too great. Detachments, however, were sent which infested the rear of the blockading army, cut off supplies, and on one occasion carried away the horses of three entire troops of cavalry. Still the line of posts which surrounded Londonderry by land remained unbroken. The river was still strictly closed and guarded. Within the walls the distress had become extreme. So early as the 8th of June, horse-flesh was almost the only meat which could be purchased, and of horse-flesh the supply was scanty. It was necessary to make up the deficiency with tallow, and even tallow was doled out with a parsimonious hand. On the 15th of June a gleam of hope appeared. The sentinels on the top of the cathedral saw sails nine miles off in the Bay of Loch Foyle. Thirty vessels of different sizes were counted. Signals were made from the steeples and returned from the mastheads, but were imperfectly understood on both sides. At last a messenger from the fleet eluded the Irish sentinels, dived under the boom, and informed the garrison that Kirk had arrived from England with troops, arms, ammunition, and provisions to relieve the city. In Londonderry expectation was at the height, but a few hours of feverish joy were followed by weeks of misery. Kirk thought it unsafe to make any attempt, either by land or by water, on the lines of the besiegers, and retired to the entrance of Loch Foyle, where, during several weeks, he lay inactive. And now the pressure of famine became every day more severe. A strict search was made in all the recesses of all the houses of the city, and some provisions, which had been concealed in cellars by people who had since died or made their escape, were discovered and carried to the magazines. The stock of cannon-balls was almost exhausted, and their place was supplied by brick-bats coated with lead. Pestilence began, as usual, to make its appearance in the train of hunger. Fifteen officers died of fever in one day. The governor, Baker, was among those who sank under the disease. His place was supplied by Colonel John Mitchelborn. Meanwhile it was known at Dublin that Kirk and his squadron were on the coast of Ulster. The alarm was great at the castle. Even before this news arrived, Avaux had given it as his opinion that Richard Hamilton was unequal to the difficulties of the situation. It had therefore been resolved that Rosen should take the chief command. He was now sent down with all speed. On the 19th of June he arrived at the headquarter of the besieging army. At first he attempted to undermine the walls, but his plan was discovered, and he was compelled to abandon it after a sharp fight, in which more than a hundred of his men were slain. Then his fury rose to a strange pitch. He, an old soldier, a marshal of France in expectancy, trained in the school of the greatest generals, accustomed during many years to scientific war, to be baffled by a mob of country gentlemen, farmers, shopkeepers, who were protected only by a wall which any good engineer would at once have pronounced untenable. He raved, he blasphemed in a language of his own, made up of all the dialects spoken from the Baltic to the Atlantic. He would raise the city to the ground, he would spare no living thing, not the young girls, not the babies at the breast. As to the leaders, death was too light a punishment for them. He would rack them, he would roast them alive. In his rage he ordered a shell to be flung into the town, with a letter containing a horrible menace. He would, he said, gather into one body all the Protestants who had remained at their homes between Charlemont and the sea, old men, women, children, many of them near in blood and affection to the defenders of Londonderry. No protection, whatever might be the authority by which it had been given, should be respected. The multitude thus brought together should be driven under the walls of Londonderry, and should there be starved to death in the sight of their countrymen, their friends, and their kinsmen. This was no idle threat. Parties were instantly sent out in all directions to collect victims. At dawn, on the morning of the 2nd of July, hundreds of Protestants, who were charged with no crime, 
who were incapable of bearing arms, and many of whom had protections granted by James, were dragged to the gates of the city. It was imagined that the piteous sight would quell the spirit of the colonists, but the only effect was to rouse that spirit to still greater energy. An order was immediately put forth that no man should utter the word surrender on pain of death, and no man uttered that word. Several prisoners of high rank were in the town. Hitherto they had been well treated, and had received as good rations as were measured out to the garrison. They were now closely confined. A gallows was erected on one of the bastions, and a message was conveyed to Rosen, requesting him to send a confessor instantly to prepare his friends for death. The prisoners, in great dismay, wrote to the savage Livonian, but received no answer. They then addressed themselves to their countryman, Richard Hamilton. They were willing, they said, to shed their blood for their king, but they thought it hard to die the ignominious death of thieves in consequence of the barbarity of their own companions in arms. Hamilton, though a man of lax principles, was not cruel. He had been disgusted by the inhumanity of Rosen, but, being only second in command, could not venture to express publicly all that he thought. He, however, remonstrated strongly. Some Irish officers felt on this occasion, as it was natural the brave men should feel, and declared, weeping with pity and indignation, that they should never cease to have in their ears the cries of the poor women and children who had been driven at the point of the pike to drive famine between the camp and the city. Rosen persisted during forty-eight hours. In that time many unhappy creatures perished, but Londonderry held out as resolutely as ever, and he saw that his crime was likely to produce nothing but hatred and obloquy. He at length gave way, and suffered the survivors to withdraw. The garrison then took down the gallows which had been erected on the bastion. When the tidings of these events reached Dublin, James, though by no means prone to compassion, was startled by an atrocity of which the civil wars of England had furnished no example, and was displeased by learning that protections, given by his authority and guaranteed by his honour, had been publicly declared to be nullities. He complained to the French ambassador, and said, with a warmth which the occasion fully justified, that Rosen was a barbarous Muscovite. Melfort could not refrain from adding that, if Rosen had been an Englishman, he would have been hanged. Avaux was utterly unable to understand this effeminate sensibility. In his opinion nothing had been done that was at all reprehensible, and he had some difficulty in commanding himself when he heard the King and the Secretary blame in strong language an act of wholesome severity. In truth the French ambassador and the French general were well paired— there was a great difference, doubtless, in appearance and manner, between the handsome, graceful, and refined diplomatist, whose dexterity and suavity had been renowned at the most polite courts of Europe, and the military adventurer, whose look and voice reminded all who came near him that he had been born in a half-savage country, that he had risen from the ranks, and that he had once been sentenced to death for marauding. But the heart of the courtier was really even more callous than that of the soldier. End of part nine. Of England, of England. Chapter twelve, part ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 12, Part 10. Rosen was recalled to Dublin, and Richard Hamilton was again left in the chief command. He tried gentler means than those which had brought so much reproach on his predecessor. No trick, no lie, which was thought likely to discourage the starving garrison, was spared. One day a great shout was raised by the whole Irish camp. The defenders of Londonderry were soon informed that the army of James was rejoicing on account of the fall of Enniskillen. They were told that they had now no chance of being relieved, and were exhorted to save their lives by capitulating. They consented to negotiate, but what they asked was that they should be permitted to depart armed and in military array, 
by land or by water at their choice. They demanded hostages for the exact fulfilment of these conditions, and insisted that the hostages should be sent on board of the fleet which lay in Loch Foyle. Such terms Hamilton durst not grant. The governors would abate nothing. The treaty was broken off, and the conflict recommenced. By this time July was far advanced, and the state of the city was, hour by hour, becoming more frightful. The number of the inhabitants had been thinned more by famine and disease than by the fire of the enemy, yet that fire was sharper and more constant than ever. One of the gates was beaten in, one of the bastions was laid in ruins, but the breaches made by day were repaired by night with indefatigable activity. Every attack was still repelled, but the fighting men of the garrison were so much exhausted that they could scarcely keep their legs. Several of them, in the act of striking at the enemy, fell down from mere weakness. A very small quantity of grain remained, and was doled out by mouthfuls. The stock of salted hides was considerable, and by gnawing them the garrison appeased the rage of hunger. Dogs, fattened on the blood of the slain who lay unburied round the town, were luxuries which few could afford to purchase. The price of a whelp's paw was five shillings and sixpence. Nine horses were still alive, and but barely alive. They were so lean that little meat was likely to be found upon them. It was, however, determined to slaughter them for food. The people perished so fast that it was impossible for the survivors to perform the rites of sepulture. There was scarcely a cellar in which some corpse was not decaying. Such was the extremity of distress that the rats who came to feast in those hideous dens were eagerly hunted and greedily devoured. A small fish caught in the river was not to be purchased with money. The only price for which such a treasure could be obtained was some handfuls of oatmeal. Leprosies, such as strange and unwholesome diet engenders, made existence a constant torment. The whole city was poisoned by the stench exhaled from the bodies of the dead and of the half-dead. That there should be fits of discontent and insubordination among men enduring such misery was inevitable. At one moment it was suspected that Walker had laid up somewhere a secret store of food, and was revelling in private, while he exhorted others to suffer resolutely for the good cause. His house was strictly examined, his innocence was fully proved, he regained his popularity, and the garrison, with death in near prospect, thronged to the cathedral to hear him preach, drank in his earnest eloquence with delight, and went forth from the house of God with haggard faces and tottering steps, but with spirit still unsubdued. There were indeed some secret plottings. A very few obscure traitors opened communications with the enemy, but it was necessary that all such dealings should be carefully concealed. None dared to utter publicly any words save words of defiance and stubborn resolution. Even in that extremity the general cry was, No surrender! And there were not wanting voices which in low tones added, First the horses and hides, and then the prisoners, and then each other. It was afterwards related, half in jest, yet not without a horrible mixture of earnest, that a corpulent citizen, whose bulk presented a strange contrast to the skeletons which surrounded him, thought it expedient to conceal himself from the numerous eyes which followed him with cannibal looks whenever he appeared in the streets. It was no slight aggravation of the sufferings of the garrison that all this time the English ships were seen far off in Loch Foyle. Communication between the fleet and the city was almost impossible. One diver who had attempted to pass the boom was drowned, another was hanged. The language of signals was hardly intelligible. On the 13th of July, however, a piece of paper sewed up in a cloth button came to Walker's hands. It was a letter from Kirk, and contained assurances of speedy relief, but more than a fortnight of intense misery had since elapsed, and the hearts of the most sanguine were sick with deferred hope. By no art could the provisions which were left be made to hold out two days more. Just at this time Kirk received a dispatch from England, 
which contained positive orders that Londonderry should be relieved. He accordingly determined to make an attempt which, as far as appears, he might have made, with at least an equally fair prospect of success, six weeks earlier. Among the merchant ships which had come to Loch Foyle under his convoy was one called the Mountjoy. The master, Micaiah Browning, a native of Londonderry, had brought from England a large cargo of provisions. He had, it is said, repeatedly remonstrated against the inaction of the armament. He now eagerly volunteered to take the first risk of succouring his fellow-citizens, and his offer was accepted. Andrew Douglas, master of the Phoenix, who had on board a great quantity of meal from Scotland, was willing to share the danger and the honour. The two merchantmen were to be escorted by the Dartmouth frigate of thirty-six guns, commanded by Captain John Leake, afterwards an admiral of great fame. It was the 13th of July. The sun had just set, the evening sermon in the cathedral was over, and the heart-broken congregation had separated, when the sentinels on the tower saw the sails of three vessels coming up the foil. Soon there was a stir in the Irish camp. The besiegers were on the alert for miles along both shores. The ships were in extreme peril, for the river was low, and the only navigable channel ran very near to the left bank, where the headquarters of the enemy had been fixed, and where the batteries were most numerous. Leake performed his duty with a skill and spirit worthy of his noble profession, exposed his frigate to cover the merchantmen, and used his guns with great effect. At length the little squadron came to the place of peril. Then the Mountjoy took the lead, and went right at the bottom. The huge barricade cracked and gave way, but the shock was such that the Mountjoy rebounded and stuck in the mud. A yell of triumph rose from the banks. The Irish rushed to their boats, and were preparing to board, but the Dartmouth poured on them a well-directed broadside, which threw them into disorder. Just then the Phoenix dashed at the breach which the Mountjoy had made, and was in a moment within the fence. Meantime the tide was rising fast. The Mountjoy began to move, and soon passed safe through the broken stakes and floating spars. But her brave master was no more. A shot from one of the batteries had struck him, and he died by the most enviable of all deaths, in sight of the city which was his birthplace, which was his home, and which had just been saved by his courage and self-devotion from the most frightful form of destruction. The night had closed in before the conflict at the boom began, but the flash of the guns was seen, and the noise heard, by the lean and ghastly multitude which covered the walls of the city. When the Mountjoy grounded, and when the shout of triumph rose from the Irish of both sides of the river, the hearts of the besieged died within them. One who endured the unutterable anguish of that moment has told that they looked fearfully livid in each other's eyes. Even after the barricade had been passed, there was a terrible half-hour of suspense. It was ten o'clock before the ships arrived at the quay. The whole population was there to welcome them. A screen made of casks filled with earth was hastily thrown up to protect the landing-place from the batteries on the other side of the river, and then the work of unloading began. First were rolled on shore barrels containing six thousand bushels of meal. Then came great cheeses, casks of beef, flitches of bacon, kegs of butter, sacks of peas and biscuit, anchors of brandy. Not many hours before, half a pound of tallow and three-quarters of a pound of salted hide had been weighed out with niggardly care to every fighting man. The ration which each now received was three pounds of flour, two pounds of beef, and a pint of peas. It is easy to imagine with what tears grace was said over the suppers of that evening. There was little sleep on either side of the wall. The bonfires shone bright along the whole circuit of the ramparts. The Irish guns continued to roar all night, and all night the bells of the rescued city made answer to the Irish guns with a peal of joyous defiance. Through the whole of the 31st of July the batteries of the enemy continued to play, but soon after the sun had again gone down flames were seen arising from the camp, and when the 1st of August dawned, a line of smoking ruins marked the site lately occupied by the huts of the besiegers, and the citizens saw far off the long column of pikes and standards, retreating up the left bank of the foil towards Strabane. 
so ended this great siege, the most memorable in the annals of the British Isles. It had lasted a hundred and five days. The garrison had been reduced from about seven thousand effective men to about three thousand. The loss of the besiegers cannot be precisely ascertained. Walker estimated it at eight thousand men. It is certain, from the dispatches of Avaux, that the regiments which returned from the blockade had been so much thinned that many of them were not more than two hundred strong. Of thirty-six French gunners, who had superintended the cannonading, thirty-one had been killed or disabled. The means both of attack and defence had undoubtedly been such as would have moved the great warriors of the continent to laughter, and this is the very circumstance which gives so peculiar an interest to the history of the contest. It was a contest not between engineers, but between nations, and the victory remained with the nation which, though inferior in number, was superior in civilization, in capacity for self-government, and in stubbornness of resolution. As soon as it was known that the Irish army had retired, a deputation from the city hastened to Loch Foyle, and invited Kirk to take the command. He came accompanied by a long train of officers, and was received in state by the two governors, who delivered up to him the authority which, under the pressure of necessity, they had assumed. He remained only a few days, but he had time to show enough of the incurable vices of his character to disgust a population distinguished by austere morals and ardent public spirit. There was, however, no outbreak. The city was in the highest good humour. Such quantities of provisions had been landed from the fleet that there was in every house a plenty never before known. A few days earlier a man had been glad to obtain for twenty pence a mouthful of carrion scraped from the bones of a starved horse. A pound of good beef was now sold for three half-pence. Meanwhile all hands were busied in removing corpses which had been thinly covered with earth, in filling up the holes which the shells had ploughed in the ground, and in repairing the battered roofs of the houses. The recollection of past dangers and privations, and the consciousness of having deserved well of the English nation, and of all Protestant churches, swelled the hearts of the townspeople with honest pride. That pride grew stronger when they received from William a letter acknowledging, in the most affectionate language, the debt which he owed to the brave and trusty citizens of his good city. The whole population crowded to the diamond to hear the royal epistle read. At the close, all the guns on the ramparts sent forth a voice of joy. All the ships in the river made answer. Barrels of ale were broken up, and the health of their majesties was drunk with shouts and volleys of musketry. Five generations have passed away, and still the wall of Londonderry is to the Protestants of Ulster what the trophy of Marathon was to the Athenians. A lofty pillar rising from a bastion which bore during many weeks the heaviest fire of the enemy is seen far up and far down the foil. On the summit is the statue of Walker, such as when, in the last and most terrible emergency, his eloquence roused the fainting courage of his brethren. In one hand he grasps a Bible. The other, pointing down the river, seems to direct the eyes of his famished audience to the English topmasts in the distant bay. Such a monument was well deserved, yet it was scarcely needed, for in truth the whole city is, to this day, a monument of the great deliverance. The wall is carefully preserved, nor would any plea of health or convenience be held by the inhabitants sufficient to justify the demolition of that sacred enclosure which, in the evil time, gave shelter to their race and their religion. The summit of the ramparts forms a pleasant walk, the bastions have been turned into little gardens. Here and there, among the shrubs and flowers, may be seen the old culverins, which scattered bricks cased with lead among the Irish ranks. One antique gun, the gift of the fishmongers of London, was distinguished during the hundred and five memorable days by the loudness of its report, and still bears the name of Roaring Meg. The cathedral is filled with relics and trophies. In the vestibule is a huge shell, one of many hundreds of shells which were thrown into the city. Over the altar are still seen the French flagstaves, taken by the garrison in a desperate sally. The white ensigns of the House of Bourbon 
have long been dust, but their place has been supplied by new banners, the work of the fairest hands of Ulster. The anniversary of the day on which the gates were closed, and the anniversary of the day on which the siege was raised, have been down to our own time celebrated by salutes, processions, banquets, and sermons. Lundy has been executed in effigy, and the sword, said by tradition to be that of Maumont, has on great occasions been carried in triumph. There is still a Walker Club and a Murray Club. The humble tombs of the Protestant captains have been carefully sought out, repaired, and embellished. It is impossible not to respect the sentiment which indicates itself by these tokens. It is a sentiment which belongs to the higher and purer part of human nature, and which adds not a little to the strength of states. A people which takes no pride in the noble achievements of remote ancestors will never achieve anything worthy to be remembered with pride by remote descendants. Yet it is impossible for the moralists or the statesmen to look with unmixed complacency on the solemnities with which London Derry commemorates her deliverance, and on the honours which she pays to those who saved her. Unhappily, the animosities of her brave champions have descended with their glory. The faults which are ordinarily found in dominant castes and dominant sects have not seldom shown themselves without disguise at her festivities, and even with the expressions of pious gratitude which have resounded from her pulpits, have too often been mingled words of wrath and defiance. The Irish army which had retreated to Straban remained there but a very short time. The spirit of the troops had been depressed by their recent failure, and was soon completely cowed by the news of a great disaster in another quarter. Three weeks before this time, the Duke of Berwick had gained an advantage over a detachment of the Enniskilleners, and had by their own confession killed or taken more than fifty of them. They were in hopes of obtaining some assistance from Kirk, to whom they had sent a deputation, and they still persisted in rejecting all terms offered by the enemy. It was therefore determined at Dublin that an attack should be made upon them from several quarters at once. McCarthy, who had been rewarded for his services in Munster with the title of Viscount Mount Cashel, marched towards Loch Erne from the east with three regiments of foot, two regiments of dragoons, and some troops of cavalry. A considerable force, which lay encamped near the mouth of the river Drowse, was at the same time to advance from the west. The Duke of Berwick was to come from the north with such horse and dragoons as could be spared from the army which was besieging Londonderry. The Enniskilleners were not fully apprised of the whole plan which had been laid for their destruction, but they knew that McCarthy was on the road with a force exceeding any which they could bring into the field. Their anxiety was in some degree relieved by the return of the deputation which they had sent to Kirk. Kirk could spare no soldiers, but he had sent some arms, some ammunition, and some experienced officers, of whom the chief were Colonel Wolseley and Lieutenant Colonel Berry. These officers had come by sea, round the coast of Donegal, and had run up the line. On Sunday, the 29th of July, it was known that their boat was approaching the island of Enniskillen. The whole population, male and female, came to the shore to greet them. It was with difficulty that they made their way to the castle, through the crowds which hung on them, blessing God that dear old England had not quite forgotten the Englishman who upheld her cause against great odds in the heart of Ireland. Wolseley seems to have been in every respect well qualified for his post. He was a staunch Protestant, had distinguished himself among the Yorkshiremen who rose up for the Prince of Orange and a free Parliament, and had, if he is not belied, proved his zeal for liberty and pure religion by causing the Mayor of Scarborough, who had made a speech in favour of King James, to be brought into the market-place and well tossed there in a blanket. This vehement hatred of popery was in the estimation of the men of Enniskillen the first of all qualifications for command, and Wolseley had other and more important qualifications. Though himself regularly bred to war, he seems to have had a peculiar aptitude for the management of irregular troops. He had scarcely taken on himself the chief command when he received notice that Mount Cashel had laid siege to the castle of Crum. Crum was the frontier garrison of the Protestants of Fermanagh, 
the ruins of the old fortifications are now among the attractions of a beautiful pleasure ground situated on a woody promontory which overlooks Loch Urn. Wolseley determined to raise the siege. He sent Berry forward with such troops as could be instantly put in motion, and promised to follow speedily with a larger force. Berry, after marching some miles, encountered thirteen companies of McCarthy's dragoons, commanded by Antony, the most brilliant and accomplished of all who bore the name of Hamilton, but much less successful as a soldier than as a courtier, a lover, and a writer. Hamilton's dragoons ran at the first fire. He was severely wounded, and his second in command was shot dead. McCarthy soon came up to support Hamilton, and at the same time Wolseley came up to support Berry. The hostile armies were now in presence of each other. McCarthy had above five thousand men and several pieces of artillery. The Enniskilleners were under three thousand, and they had marched in such haste that they had brought only one day's provisions. It was therefore absolutely necessary for them either to fight instantly or to retreat. Wolseley determined to consult the men, and this determination, which in ordinary circumstances would have been most unworthy of a general, was fully justified by the peculiar composition and temper of the little army, an army made up of gentlemen and yeomen, fighting not for pay, but for their lands, their wives, their children, and their god. The ranks were drawn up under arms, and the question was put, Advance or retreat? The answer was an universal shout of advance. Wolseley gave out the word, No popery. It was received with loud applause. He instantly made his dispositions for an attack. As he approached, the enemy, to his great surprise, began to retire. The Enniskilleners were eager to pursue with all speed, but their commander, suspecting a snare, restrained their ardour, and positively forbade them to break their ranks. Thus one army retreated, and the other followed, in good order, through the little town of Newton Butler. About a mile from that town the Irish faced about, and made a stand. Their position was well chosen. They were drawn up on a hill, at the foot of which lay a deep bog. A narrow paved causeway which ran across the bog was the only road by which the cavalry of the Enniskilleners could advance for on the right and left were pools, turf-pits, and quagmires, which afforded no footing to horses. McCarthy placed his cannon in such a manner as to sweep this causeway. Wolseley ordered his infantry to the attack. They struggled through the bog, made their way to firm ground, and rushed on the guns. There was then a short and desperate fight. The Irish cannoneers stood gallantly to their pieces till they were cut down to a man. The Enniskillen horse, no longer in danger of being mowed down by the fire of the artillery, came fast up the causeway. The Irish dragoons who had run away in the morning were smitten with another panic, and without striking a blow galloped from the field. The horse followed the example. Such was the terror of the fugitives, that many of them spurred hard till their beasts fell down, and then continued to fly on foot, throwing away carbines, swords, and even coats, as encumbrances. The infantry, seeing themselves deserted, flung down their pikes and muskets, and ran for their lives. The conquerors now gave loose to that ferocity which has seldom failed to disgrace the civil wars of Ireland. The butchery was terrible. Near fifteen hundred of the vanquished were put to the sword. About five hundred more, in ignorance of the country, took a road which led to Loch Urn. The lake was before them, the enemy behind. They plunged into the waters, and perished there. McCarthy, abandoned by his troops, rushed into the midst of the pursuers, and very nearly found the death which he sought. He was wounded in several places, he was struck to the ground, and in another moment his brains would have been knocked out with the butt-end of a musket, when he was recognised and saved. The colonists lost only twenty men killed, and fifty wounded. They took four hundred prisoners, seven pieces of cannon, fourteen barrels of powder, all the drums and all the colours of the vanquished enemy. The battle of Newton Butler was won on the same afternoon on which the boom thrown over the foil was broken. At Straban the news met the Celtic army which was retreating from Londonderry. All was terror and confusion. The tents were struck, the military stores were flung by wagon-loads into the waters of the morn, and the dismayed Irish leaving many sick and wounded to the mercy of the victorious Protestants, fled to Omar, and thence to Charlemont. Southfield, who commanded at Sligo, found it necessary to abandon that town, 
which was instantly occupied by a detachment of Kirk's troops. Dublin was in consternation. James dropped words which indicated an intention of flying to the continent. Evil tidings, indeed, came fast upon him, almost at the same time at which he learnt that one of his armies had raised the siege of Londonderry, and that another had been routed at Newton Butler, he received intelligence scarcely less disheartening from Scotland. It is now necessary to trace the progress of those events to which Scotland owes her political and her religious liberty, her prosperity, and her civilization. The End of History of England, Chapter 12, Part 10